Adler. I'm the director of special programs. It's my job to do these kaleidoscope events. What I'd like to do is introduce our two speakers tonight. Um, the first workshop will be by Becky Castro. She'll talk, you can ask her questions, and then we'll take a very brief break, and Lucy Lewis will talk for us. With that, um, Becky Castro, CPCC, PCC, has been an entrepreneur for the past 24 years. She's a certified business and personal coach and a proud owner of I Love Mondays, MondayMornings.com, a company that re-inspires solopreneurs and CEOs to wake up in the morning passionate about their careers instead of hitting the snooze button and rolling over, like I felt this morning. As a single mom, she's helped lawyers, realtors, CEOs spanning several industries nearly double their income and streamline their systems while fine-tuning the balancing act of juggling home and work. Last year, the WBOA named her their 2010 Businesswoman of the Year. Her company, I Love MondayMornings.com, is based on, on the fact that if you don't like your Monday mornings, then you need to take a look at your career and home life and make some changes. Her motto is simple. If you aren't daring yourself forward, then you're settling. Don't ever give up on what you want in life. Who wants to die with regrets? And Lucy, Dr. Lucy Lewis is a Springfield native. She holds a bachelor's in elementary education from American International College, a master's in human services administration from Springfield College, and a doctorate in educational leadership from William Howard Taft University. She's worked in commercial banking as both a credit analyst and a small business commercial lender, and in economic development as a financial analyst and business consultant. She has 22 years' experience in higher education in the Office of Institutional Research. She has an in-depth understanding of planning and evaluation, evaluation or assessment, and an insightful analytical ability. This experience has shaped a unique perspective of the business process. People who have worked with Lucy describe her as someone who has the unique ability to see things clearly from a different perspective. As a planning and assessment specialist, she brings order and understanding by just knowing how to see to the heart of the matter. It's Lucy's formal training in management and leadership, her insights and expertise that help you to see a clear path to where you want to go and how to get there in an orderly, efficient way. Lucy has used her instinctive understanding of the process management and assessment for years to help others work through their projects or to improve business performance. Her small business clients have been able to gain a deeper understanding of the issues in their business. She helps them to define solutions to increase efficiency and effectiveness in their business endeavors. Yet when Lucy herself made the transition from employee to entrepreneur, she struggled with using these classic techniques to understand her own business and get organized. Finally, she let go of the formal process and learned to trust her own instincts and to view her business through her own unique lens. Once she did this, she was able to order her business and start moving forward. And with that, I'd like to welcome Becky Castro. Thank you. <clears throat> so welcome, everybody. Um, one of the questions that I've been facing as an entrepreneur um, is when you have a product or a service, the next question is, well, who's going to buy it? Right? So you're starting here, I have this great product or service, and then way over here you want somebody to say, here's my credit card. And this thing, it's poorly drawn, but it's a pipeline, um, as it's known in sales and marketing. So that's what we want to discover, what's between here and here. And most people, what they think is in between there and there is one communication. So I tell you about what it is that I do, and the next thing is you say, great, sign me up. And actually, that's only happened to me twice um, in 25 years, and it was great because they didn't even say how much do you charge, but that is definitely not the norm. And it would be nice if it happens again, but I'm not looking for it. So what's, what's in between that spot? That's what we want to look at. And the reason why that's so important is that only 2% of sales are made <clears throat> after the first touch, after that first contact, only 2% of sales are made then. Um, so what we really want to be thinking about is how do we, what do we do for the 98% of all other sales, right? If 2% of sales happen on the first contact, what about the 98% of all the other sales? Before I map that out for you, and that's what the kind of flowchart is down in the bottom right, before I map that out for you, I want to talk about the other stats <clears throat> because they're pretty staggering. Um, a full 48% of salespeople do not follow up with their contact. So <laughs> it sounds like somebody is interested in you. 48% never follow up. 25% um, of salespeople make a second contact and then they stop. And by the way, when I'm talking about salespeople, I'm talking about everybody in this room, not 
right? Somebody who is your salesperson. We're all salespeople. If we have a product or a service and we own a business, we are all salespeople. 12% um, of salespeople only make three contacts and then they stop. Um, <clears throat> when do most people give up? I think of this like playing baseball. So we think, okay, no, I tried once, I tried again, I tried the third time, three strikes and you're out. And the problem with that is a no really means not now. It doesn't mean no, not ever. It just means no, not now. Um, <clears throat> what I want to show you how to do is to maintain consistent and incremental contacts. They can be big or they can be small in that sales cycle. So there are as few gaps as possible. You don't want to try one thing, then try another approach, then try another approach. You want to be consistent. Um, the bottom line <clears throat> goal is going to be to develop and build qualified potential relationships. That's what you're trying to do. And you want to get prospects on your list or a database. Sometimes I call it a list or a database. You want to get people on your list, either online or offline, so you can market to your prospects over time um, until they either buy from you or they say, stop marketing to me. Um, <clears throat> your, business, your list, by the way, is what I consider your most valuable asset. It's like a house. Your list is that important. So tonight, regardless of if you have a business and you want more clients or you're thinking about starting a business and you don't yet have that product or service, you can get started designing your sales process. Now before I dig into those details, I'm assuming that you have a few things already in place. Namely that you have people in your pipeline. So that's right way over on the left on my drawing there. If you don't, here's a few ideas on how to get started. First, you need to frequent the places where your target market frequents. So professional organizations, meetings, events, online forums, social media, all kinds of social media, blogs. You want to ask the question, if I wanted this product or service, or I wanted some information about this product or service, where would I go? And that's where you want to be, because that's where your client right, is looking for your product or your service. Next, you want to look for potential clients as well as strate strategic partners and circles of influence. So other professionals who share, this is in the wrong order. <laughs> OK, other professionals who share your target market so that you can develop a network of referrals. People that are referred to you are far easier to convert as the baseline of trust has already been established. And it's something like, um, I think the close rate is like 80% of somebody's referred to you. It's extremely high. Um, the classic example of this is uh, this triangle with a mortgage lender, a lawyer, and a realtor. Um, if any of you are any of those professions, you need the other two. And then you just cross-refer. It's a great way. So whatever profession you are, you want to find somebody else or other people where you can cross-refer and develop that know, like, and trust. It's a great way to, to uh, build your business. Um, third is you want to know how to talk about your product or service so that when you tell others about it, they say, tell me more. If you're not getting that response, then you're not hitting an emotional nerve or pain or a challenge that your client is having. So you want to practice using this formula at BNI or WBOA or chamber meeting, a social event. Um, anywhere where somebody asks you, what do you do? And you answer them. You need to hear, tell me more. If not, change what you're saying. Now, I've written um, up here the formula just because I think this is so important. So you want to say, I do whatever it is for whatever type of client it is so they can, and you want to add the benefit here. What you don't want to say is, I'm a certified business coach, and I help business owners make more money. That's like, mm, blah, flat. <laughs> it's not going to get the tell me more. Um, what I say right now is I'm passionate about helping business owners get their phone to ring. Now, that usually generates tell me more. If that doesn't, when I say I love Monday mornings on my name tag, that always gets a tell me more. So you want something that's going to generate a response. So <clears throat> the sales um, playing field has really shifted dramatically in the last several years. The old model, very simplified, was to put an ad in the paper, do some cold calling, have some face-to-face -face meetings, and then hound out some brochures. The goal is to make a profit and to reduce costs as much as possible. Most businesses operated from 9 to 5, and they were in one time zone. The new paradigm on how to market allows us to pick and choose how we each structure our businesses because a company is really just someone's vision 
with a structure that is set up to achieve that vision. So your company's goal is to bring your, part, your product or service to market, but with all the new technology, there's just a whole array of options as to how you would go about doing that. So one thing that every business owner needs is qualified clients. And like I was just saying, all that technology has changed. So consider, and consider that finding and expanding your list just got a whole lot easier. So remember again, this is your number one asset to increase that list. Communication is cross-cultural, intergenerational, available 24-7, and fast as lightning. There are ways to communicate for both introverts and extroverts, night owls and early risers, supporting all different types of personalities, lifestyles, and needs, be they professional, business, family, educational. Then consumer feedback is highly visible, it's responsive, and it's interactive. And lastly, you can advertise and sell while you sleep with a shopping cart without a storefront. Like, how cool is that? This means that your clients can be easily international. So with my European clients, I Skype with them. With one of them, and he has the technology, I didn't even have the technology, he's like, hook on to my hard drive. I was like, okay, what, what do I type in? So there's this code and a passcode, and I type in, and I'm on his hard drive, and I'm looking at his screen. So there's just some amazing stuff that can happen right now. Um, even cross-promotion and strategic alliance have taken on a whole new meaning. I was on this training about a month ago that was through Facebook. We were on the fan, fan page of the person who was leading the seminar. And not only could I see every other participant, but I could see, obviously, the presenter and the person who was hosting. So now we all have a way to communicate with each other instead of before where it was basically the presenter had a way to communicate with the audience. So it's just some really cool stuff that's going on. Um, similarly, if you log on to, um, to Meetup or to Baypath, you can find the other women in this room, which, again, is a really great way to keep the communication going. Um, here's some challenges and some things that I've learned about sales and marketing. It's really easy to get discouraged. Um, results come after time, and they're not immediate. Um, no matter how successful you are, from time to time you will wonder if you're going in the right direction, if you're completing the right actions. You will doubt yourself again and again. And the solution that I have found with that one is you just have to get up. Every time you fall down, you just have to get up and say, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to find a way. I recommend that people find a mentor, a coach, a friend, especially to find other entrepreneurs who are going through what you're going through. Because we all need allies, and the rest of the world is going to think that you're crazy for starting your own business or for having your own business because they think that their job is secure. And we know now that that is not true, but that's still a little bit in, the, in, the, in our culture. Um, you know you're going to be going in the right direction when there's fewer bottlenecks and gaps in your sales cycle. However, you're never going to be in the situation where there's no bottlenecks because your business is always evolving. You want to keep your focus on your vision, and I say just give about 5% attention to your doubts. And this one is the most important. Remember that only 48% of people follow up on a lead. So if all you do is follow up on your leads, you're ahead of the game. You're going to be infinitely ahead of the game. And these are the other stats that I wanted to read you. <clears throat> There we go. 2% of sales are made on the first contact. 3% of sales are made on the second contact. 5% of sales are made on the third contact. 10% of sales are made on the fourth. But here's the most staggering statistic. 80% of sales are made between the fifth and the twelfth contact. And that's why you can't give up after three times. You got to stretch it out. And that's what that map at the bottom, so on the lower right, that's what we're going to map out at the end to make sure that you have enough contacts with your client base um, so that, again, they're either going to buy from you or they're going to say, stop marketing to me, which is fine. I mean, we all have to make choices and decide, I don't want to be on this mailing list anymore, or I do because I'm, I'm getting value from it. Okay, so if only 2% of people are buying on the spot, what do you do to stay top of mind with your potential clients and hold their attention for the next 5 to 12 contacts, which again is where 80% of the sales happen? 
And how do you know where you are at any point? So <clears throat> we're going to define this uh, flow chart. And the way that I like to think about this is uh, the movie E.T. And when Elliot had to get E.T. out to the shed, he just didn't say, hey, E.T., we need to go to the shed and hide. What he did is he got some candy, right, Reese's Pieces, and dropped them and made a trail all the way out to the shed. And that's really what your sales process, and actually your marketing process is too, but it's really what your sales process is, is directing somebody along in the path that you want to go to and where you want to go to. I mean, E.T. could have decided we're going to the garage instead and led the trail out to the garage. So if you're putting down, if E.T., if uh, Elliot was putting down Reese's Pieces and E.T. wasn't coming, then Elliot would have to change. You know, maybe E.T. would have liked, I don't know, Doritos, right? So that's how you tell if, what you're, if your marketing or your sales is working. That's how you tell because you're leading people in a path, and if they're coming along, it's working. If they're not, you need to change it. You don't want to change everything up at the same moment, or you're not going to be able to tell what worked. So you can only change incrementally to see what worked. Okay. Um, and then there's other things that you can change. So you can change, so I was talking about, so method, frequency, or information um, that, you're, that you're providing. So method might be potato chips versus Reese's Pieces. Frequency might be longer steps in between, right, or bigger amounts, smaller amounts. Um, so how often you're sending out your newsletter or whatever the pieces are. And then the information, it has to be valuable because obviously if it's not, people are going to sign off right away as we are all completely bombarded. So this begs the question, when do people buy? If you have to make all these steps along the way, when do people buy? And the bottom line really is people buy when they know you, they like you, and they trust you. So how do you get somebody to know you, right? You could do an event like this. Like right now, you guys know who I am. You might forget tomorrow, or you might remember that I said, and so that would help you know who I am. Do you like me? Some of you are going to like me. Some of you aren't going to like me. That's fine. I'm not for everybody. I'm for the people that I connect with. Do you trust me? Usually that doesn't happen in one setting. That happens over time. And that's why there's a pipeline there. Because, again, people are going to know, like, and trust you depending on who you are and who they are and what else is going on in their life. There's so many factors. Um, the other reason when people buy is people buy when they're ready. <coughs> So the example I like to use is weight loss. I need to lose weight. I know that. But I also know I'm not ready. So I could have a bunch of people telling me about their great product or their great support system and helping me do that or their great gym or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, 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 that sounds really nice. Yep, mm -hmm, sounds good. But I'm not ready to buy, so it doesn't really matter, right? But when I'm ready, if that person who's been spending all that effort educating me about them isn't in front of me, so they're not top of mind, I'm not going to buy from them. I'm going to buy from somebody who showed up when I needed them. And that's why it's so critical to be consistent and to, to keep marketing right to the people that you want to sell to. Um, the other thing is that there's different ways that you can motivate somebody to take action sooner. Um, there's something called lowering the barrier of entry. You can use different price points. Um, I'm going to see how much time we have because there's some more information that I can give you about that. And we'll just see how, how far we get in this. Um, you definitely want to make the process as automated as possible um, so that you're not... You know, a lot of people joke about their pile of business cards that are just collecting dust. And I'm like, why did you go to the event if you're not going to do something with the business cards? I mean, that's a waste of your time. What I recommend to a lot of my clients is that if they schedule, if they schedule time to go to an event where they're going to network. At the same time, you want to schedule time to actually follow up with the networking afterwards. Because otherwise, right, what's the, what's the point? It's a waste. OK. Um, some other things in here. OK. Um, the chart that we're going to work on, you really want to customize to your own personality. Um, you can, the biggest mistake that I see people making is trying to be like other people instead of trying to be like themselves. And I think for some strange reason, we just think, you know, it's easier to like copy somebody else than like be authentic. Um, the typical example right now is everybody saying, you know, I've got to do my social media. You know, I've got to do LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and that's the way, and that will solve everything. And I think for some people, that's true. 
But I think for some people, it's not a match and it's not true. Or maybe you need one of those forms. You don't need all three. What I believe is that you're going to survive and be successful and actually be happy um, by being true to yourself, even if that's the scariest thing that you'll ever do. And it's going to require taking risks to be you and to dare yourself to be authentic. Being yourself is going to be your beacon. Without a doubt, it will always be your beacon. And it's never, in my opinion, it will never steer you wrong um, at any stage of your life. Um, Angela, Angela Lucier posted this great quote on Facebook by Sark over the summer. And it, it goes like this. It's none of my business what other people think of me. I just think it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful quote to remind yourself, like, what's important to you? Um, and this is from Steve Jobs. I went and read that commencement speech at Stanford. It's excellent if you haven't read it or read it a while ago. Um, he says, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be tapped by dogma, which is living with the results. Don't be trapped, excuse me. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important... Have the courage to follow your heart and your intuition. Then somehow, they somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. I think the second mistake that we try to, that we um, have is trying to do it all or even thinking that trying to do it all is possible. The list that I'm going to read you um, is really a menu and it's really meant for you to pick which ones match you and your style of doing sales and marketing. And you get to pick which communication um, venues appeal to you. Your successes will not be about utilizing all of the available technologies. The new ones are coming fast and furious. I mean, who can even keep up? It's just incredible what's going on right now. Um, contrary to the current buzz, there is no formula. I don't believe there is a formula for which technology to use. I really believe it's custom. And I don't believe that there's a right way as long as you're getting the results. I mean, isn't that the question? Am I getting what I want? Use that technology. Don't just use technology. <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> here's a couple examples. I know somebody who did um, a snail mail campaign. Now, who would think of using the post office right now? And it worked because we're all bombarded on the Internet. So you go to your mail and you get something, you're like, wow. You know, and you open it and you hold it and, you know, it's real. I mean, and it worked. Um, I know somebody else um, who used a billboard to get attention. They had never used, it was an industry, had never used billboards to get attention before, but it worked because it was different. Um, I know somebody who uses Twitter and it's not about saying, oh, I'm here doing this right now. It's actually to do research, but it's connected them with other people who are doing what they're doing and they've gotten business that way. So there's a lot of really innovative ways to, to get business. So does it sound like a ton of work? When I read the list, it probably will. But <clears throat> I'm going to talk about Steve Jobs again for a minute because he was such an inspiring person. I mean, changed so many industries and <clears throat> feisty, very feisty. But, um, you know, I just think about what would the world be like without his contributions, without all of his contributions. So he says, sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I love what I do. You've got to find what you love. And that is as true for your work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking until you find it. Don't settle. So I'm going to read. What I want you to do is take out a piece of paper and draw yourself a flow chart. It can be... Uh, you know, it can be a line that goes straight across or it can go in any configuration that you want. And what I want to do is read to you a list of different ways to communicate with your audience. And it's quite a long list. There's probably about 60 different items on it. 
And when you hear one that you're like, oh yeah, I could do that, or oh yeah, I'd like that, then put it down. And the reason why I say this is, like one of them is sending out funny jokes. Now, if you do not like jokes, this is not the item for you because they won't be funny, and your friends are gonna know, that, and your clients will know that right, this is not your thing. But like if you love doing videos and you wanna do a video, then write that one down. And at the end, I guarantee you'll have more than 12, um, which is great. And you don't have to worry about this whole long list because anybody who wants a list, I'll just send you the PDF of the list and then you can go through it at your leisure. But what I want you to think about is which things appeal to you so that you could have this list of 12 ways to communicate with your client base. Okay, so. You can send announcements about a new location, a new service, a new employee, a new website, a talk you're giving, an article you just published in Business West, et cetera, et cetera. You can send out a monthly or weekly e-letter or a tip that's worth it to read. You can mail or email your menu of services or offerings whenever it changes. You can send an email to somebody who's going through a hard time just to let them know that you care. You can send cards and gifts and include a business card. So Valentine's Day, I always pick the ones that everybody else doesn't. Like I would not do one over the holidays. I'll do Thanksgiving, I'll do Valentine's Day, right? I wanna stand out. I do not wanna blend in. Um, <clears throat> birthdays is another good one, I think, because people care about being acknowledged on their birthday. You can make a video of yourself talk, talking on some topic that you're passionate about post it on YouTube, and then send them a link to go visit. Post it on your website, too. Um, you can send a joke per month. You can participate in a breast cancer walk, any, any kind of charity walk, and tell your friends that, and your client base that's what you're doing. You can ask them to sponsor you or join you. You can send an announcement of, a, of an award, of continuing professional training that you've completed, and invite them to have a conversation with you about what you learned. You can forward them something of interest, a tip, an article, a website, something that may help them. You can introduce people um, to others at networking events. So if you're a really good networker, right, this would be something that would be an excellent thing that, was, that would be on your flow chart. Um, you can call somebody that you've met and ask them to have coffee. That's a real typical one, but it's not the only one, right? I hear that so much. It just I just get bored of that. Oh, let's have coffee. <laughs> there's, there's 50 other choices. Um, you can write a thank you note. Notice I didn't say email uh, to somebody who did you a favor or who took the time to meet you. Um, you can do a favor for somebody without any um, expectation. Um, at the very least, you should have a one-page website. It's very easy to do that. You should definitely have that because people need a way to contact you. It legitimizes you and gives you some credibility. Um, I know somebody, he hosted monthly potlucks. That's all he did. He didn't have 12. He just did a potluck every single month. And people came and they'd say, how do you know, I forget what his name was, how do you know so-and-so? And this guy was a coach, and that's how they knew him, and they would talk about how he helped them, and that's how he grew his business. Um, you can drop, you can send an email that has a success story in it, so the problem your client has, how your service or product um, solve that problem and what was the impact you don't want just want problem and solution you want the impact so it relieved stress you know it created more time in their day right it gave them something it let them you know go on vacation um, without having to worry about who was holding down the fort um, <clears throat> you can call to find out more about their businesses about their business and they may ask about your business too um, this is more when you would be exploring like are you a good fit for them one of the things that, that you want to be doing in this process, there's some other steps that you want to be doing in the process. You, you obviously want to be finding out, do they have a need for you? So the example that I give is like, if, you, if your product was um, cream for hemorrhoids, for example, you don't want to sell that to somebody that doesn't have hemorrhoids, right? I mean, your cream could be the best in the world. You know, it could be some herbal you know, formulation and smells nice and da 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 but it's like, if I don't have hemorrhoids, I'm not interested, right? Or like pizza, here's another example. You know, do I care if my pizza comes in less than 15 minutes? Or do I want pizza that has like uh, buffalo wing chicken on it and blue cheese, right? Those are two very different markets and you're gonna talk to them in a different way. 
Okay, uh, more typical. You can ask them to be a friend on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. <clears throat> you can give them um, a tune-up taste. So you could do um, some kind of demonstration of what your product or what your service is. You can call a past client. Some people ignore their past clients. You can call a past client, ask them how they're doing, what's going on. Um, you can offer a free workshop or teleclass. You can offer a low-cost workshop or a seminar, or you can offer a high-end workshop or a seminar. Okay, there's more. Anybody up to 12 already? Not yet? Okay. Um, you can practice leaving really great voicemails. That's another way to get noticed. Um, you can engage somebody in doing PR for you or learn how to do PR for yourself. Um, you can sponsor something like the Women's Night of Coffee. Um, for WBOA, you can get recognized that way. Um, you can go to networking meetings and get known that way. You have to go regularly. I hear so many people who come to WBOA and they're like, well, I came to a couple of the meetings and I just didn't get any business and so I'm not going to rejoin. And I'm like, well, that's not going to work. I mean, you have to commit to something, right? You have to go to something and give. It'd be like, I don't know, taking one, college, one class at college and, oh, this isn't for me. It's like, well... That's not going to give you an experience of college. You need to take a lot of classes. Um, you can be involved. Uh, you can join a board or a committee. Um, we mentioned before coffee. You could do lunch. You could do Skype if somebody is not local. Um, you can hire salespeople. You can actually hire outside salespeople. They can generate leads for you. We talked about snail mail. Um, advertising on a website, we talked a little bit about that. Um, you can do an audio commercial on your website or on email. You can do non-traditional workshops or seminars. There's this um, guy who does these meetings Tuesday mornings. It's called Tuesday Mornings with Tim. Um, for a long time, Suzanne, our previous president, she would do these Monday night, and I, she may still do them. She would do these Monday night meetings. You can do things like that to get attention. You can have somebody interview you and then post that interview, transcribe it if you want, or just do a video. Um, at WBOA, we have something called a spotlight. You can do a spotlight to get some more attention. You can write an ebook. Um, you can join up with other people, so affiliates, alliances, and joint ventures. You could do a trade show. You can offer a beta program, test something out with people. It's a good, great way to. Um, Actually, it's a really great way to, for people to understand what it is that you do because you can ask them for a lot of feedback if it's a beta program. Social events are a great way. Um, social marketing, we talked a little bit about that. You can do the old advertising, print uh, newspapers and magazines, any kind of collateral material. That's another way. The fax, you have to be careful in certain states with the fax, but you can send a fax. That gets a lot of attention because people don't really use faxes anymore, or not so much. So certain fields do. Um, email newsletter, all kinds of forums like Yahoo and Google, um, advertising, you can do billboards. Okay, got about 10 more. Anybody up to 12 yet? Getting there? Some people. Okay. Um, you can use radio, uh, TV advertising, you can do local, a cable, or you can do paid. You can do a lunch and learn. Um, <clears throat> meet up is another great way to meet people. You can blog. There's also something called a journal engine, which is another way to reach people. You can do that. You can do a podcast. Um, any kind of like sporting events or events um, with you know with family members. That's another. It's a so form of social event. We can meet other people. You can have a storefront. <laughs> There's another one. Um, great way to to interact with people. Um, and one good thing about storefronts that you can do is it's really good with uh, affiliates is to trade. So you're promoting somebody else's business and they're promoting yours, especially if it's related. That's another good one. Um, and then craft fairs is another one. And then even buying lists um, and doing cold calls. And then with all of that, what you want to keep doing um, is asking, um, what can I do so that my audience can know me even better? Because the more that you're sharing who you are with that audience, then the more that that know, like, and trust is actually growing. Okay, so I have some more information, but I want to um, actually open this up to questions. And then, um, yeah, I want to open this up to questions. So questions about 
like sales and marketing. Any questions about what I've said so far? Let's start there, and then I'll answer some just in general. Anything I say that was confusing, didn't make sense, straightforward, you guys got it. Um, there's a bunch of systems out there, too, that you can use. There's some software out there that you can use um, so that you're not personally doing this by hand. And depending on what size business you are, um, there's all different possibilities out there. Um, it's all custom. Yeah. Can you uh, describe a beta program? Yeah. So um, do, do you have a business now or you're thinking of one? You're thinking of one. And is it a service or a product? A service. It's a service. So um, it is something you could teach people, or uh, well, part of it is. Yeah. Part of it is. So, <clears throat> so an example might be. Um, so, say that you want to offer some kind of training, um, and so before you do the actual training, and you say you're going to charge for it. So before you do the actual training, then you can do a beta program. So maybe you charge half as much or a quarter, a quarter. And just announce to people, you know, I'm doing this beta testing and I've got this special rate. So you get more people because the price is less. Um, and then what you can do in trade for that, what you can do is ask them, I'm going to need a testimonial because that will help promote a live program, right, a real uh, program. And then um, you can also ask them for feedback, what worked, what didn't work. And it's a great testing ground for you to determine what do I need to do more of or less of. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah. So it's like yeah. pilot. Like a pilot, exactly. Yeah, that would have been a quicker way to explain that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What else? Yeah. If you thought about what are the top three resources that you would recommend, either books or websites or things for sales and marketing, what would you think about? Um, <coughs> I have to think on that. I mean, I think it's more concepts that I would recommend versus actual... Um, books and resources, but I could probably come up with some. If you have a business card or, or just write it down and just ask that question and again, it'll come to me. But I think one of the main things is really the know, like, and trust. Like, that is so important because typically what happens is people say, it, you, you find this in networking all the time, you walk up to somebody and they'll tell you what they do and then they're really expecting you to buy, like, instantly, right then and there. And it's just not going to happen when people get frustrated and they give up. And so I think once you understand that concept and you try to think, okay, well, how am I going to get, how am I going to allow somebody to know, like, and trust me? If you can answer that question, then you can promote what it is that you're doing. So if you think about <clears throat> if it's a service, like speaking is a really good way to do that because you have this instant interaction. It's going to be much harder if you just want to promote yourself on the web, right? Because how does somebody get to know you? Right? It's going to take a lot longer for that to happen. So I think that's one of the main, I mean, that's what's coming to me right now is like the know, like, and trust. And I think the other thing is providing really valuable information because the competition right now is pretty fierce, what's out there. You have to provide something of value. And I think another thing that people make a mistake on is um, not having any kind of a call to action. So like when, when you do anything then you, whenever you offer something and you put it out there, you want your audience to do something, right? You want them to call you, or you want them to try something, or you want them to come to another event, or you want something. So like knowing what that is and making sure you put that out there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Even just like a general, uh, g general question, sales and marketing. It doesn't have to be so much about this talk. Be happy to, yeah. So I think I really appreciate all the like where you're taking us all over the place. <laughs> a huge part of this is getting really to know who we are and yeah. how we really want to bring this forward. Mm -hmm. So in that process, I'm one of the thoughts I'm having because I've done some stuff. I'm, I have this very unique um, stress management sort of process, and then um, I'm developing a set of. Uh, like a series that I want to be able to offer in a variety of settings. And I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to know that it's valuable. Like, I know what I have to offer is valuable. I'm convinced about that. But how do I create really um, and use some of this so that I can elicit that feedback from them that this is valuable, which is part of that principle you talked about, about building them as the allies. Because mm -hmm. we don't know where it's going to come from, mm -hmm. but part of doing it is having fun with it to mm -hmm. discover that. Mm -hmm. So, and that, um, that's the part where I feel really stuck right now. Like, how do I use 
use some of what you're talking about to elicit them in how valuable this truly is. Because I think sometimes I'm sure, sometimes I'm not, and especially if I'm thinking about different audiences, mm -hmm. what it is I have to offer. What, what comes to mind is, let me see if this answers your question, but what comes to mind is I had a friend who wanted to um, do this special kind of dancing. It was kind of like a workout dancing, and, um, but it was kind of unusual. And so she just decided, I'm offering this on Sundays at 4 p.m. And I was like, oh, that's a terrible time. Nobody will come. And she's like, well, that's the time that works with me. And I was like, okay. So she just went. She told her friends. She had a small group of friends. She told her friends, and like two or three came. And then the next week, like two or three came and she just kept doing it. She was like, I'm doing this. This is valuable. I'm putting this out there. And she was, she was not going to give up. And it didn't really take that long. And she had like, I don't know, 10 or 15 people. And it went on for a good long time. She actually moved away from the area. Does that answer your question a little? Like, I think part of it is just being so steadfast that this is valuable. The persistence. The persistence and the steadfastness and then putting it out there. And I think if you do um, what this woman was talking about, doing a pilot, doing a beta test, and getting that feedback so that, again, I always think of ET, and I know it's, it's, it's a silly example, but it works. If you're putting out Reese's Pieces and you're not getting a response, then change it. I don't know if it's candy or it's chips, but change it. So maybe it could just be words, it could be timing, but change something just a little and see, well, now what happens? But don't lose sight of you. Like, you've got something to offer. I mean, I can hear it in your voice. So just don't ever forget that. Instead, you have to remember your allies are so critical because you will get from boyfriends, husbands, family members, what are you doing? Aren't you happy with the way things are right now? Why do you want to go out and have your own business? That's not a good idea. I mean, you're just not going to make any money. I tell you, you will get that over and over again. You have to be with other people who support you. And the only people who support you is other people who are doing what we're doing because we know what it's like and we know it works. So... Keep your support system up. Really, really key. Really key. Okay, one last question, and then we're gonna we're gonna change so we don't we keep everybody awake and alive tonight. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I um, I have a I had a business a while ago, and I went to grad school, and now I want to start my business up again. Okay. So I have a but now that I have I have a more of a science more of a technical background than I had before, so I want to reach a slightly different. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm a, a science writer. I worked before for NASA and for um, the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. okay. And I want to go back and I, I want to work for government again, maybe universities. And I want to be writing, um, I'd like to write for NASA again, but you know, more technical stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, or, or I could be writing um, you know, regulations for the EPA, that sort of thing, because mm -hmm. I have the science now. Sure. Um, but I'm, So I know what I want to do, and I know there's a need for it. I'm not exactly sure how to get in touch with the people that are, you know what I mean? It's a really specific group. I'm not really sure right. how to get in touch with them. Right. Yeah, I mean, what I would recommend in that area is like, who do you, either who do you know, like who's the safest person that you can go to? Somebody who you used to work with, somebody who you admire, who would, you know, you think would be happy to spend time with you. I mean, investigate, what are, are there other consultants who are doing what you're doing? How are they, what can you learn? Like research ways, what could you learn off of their website? Yeah. Um, you know, are there requests for proposals out there? Like, I'm not exactly sure how that industry works, but I would go to what's safe and what's, uh, where can I get some information right now? How is that working? How is that field working right now? Like start there and then just start formulating, well, okay, how can I fit into that? Or who do I know who knows somebody? It's like start anywhere and just start. You need to do some research. I know, well, I know a lot of people through, my university, like through the professors and things like that. Mm -hmm. People who graduate from the department. Yeah, so start with them and get information. How is this done? Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Or, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was just, yeah, I, I guess I just have to kind of, um, I mean, I have names, actually, and I guess I just kind of need to write to them or something. Yeah, there's... Like, Right, or conferences would be another another great way. There's some great stuff in um, in uh, Richard Bowles' book, What Colors Your Parachute? Like informational oh, yeah. interviewing, that type of a thing. Uh -huh. okay. I mean, that's really what you're doing to try to suss out. But you got to be careful who you're talking with, right? Because that's why I say you want to go to people who are kind of safe so you can find out how it's working and then you can present yourself to the people you want to present to who are going to hire you. 
So it's kind of like one level out. You just want to stay out for a little bit until you get the information. Then you're going to figure out how to, how to market it. Good evening. I'm going to call us back together again if I can. If this is a good, can everybody hear me? Usually I have a very big mouth and I don't have a lot of trouble with people hearing me, but I'm going to be good. And <laughs> so first I want to thank you for sharing the evening with me tonight. As a new member to the, BW, the WBOA, I am quite honored to be able to be part of this series in my first year as a member. Uh, so this is, this is quite wonderful for me uh, to be part of this professional development. And I want to take a few minutes. I know that Brianna introduced me at the beginning, but I just want to take a few minutes and um, share my story with you uh, from, a, from a perspective of how I learned about business, to think about business the way I think about business. As Brianna mentioned, I began my career in the world of banking as a commercial banker. And I started at Valley Bank in, shall we say, 1978, just a few short years ago. And I was started as a financial analyst. And through that experience, I learned to understand the nuts and bolts of business from a financial perspective. That's where I started. Because banks look, when you go to a bank to get a loan, they're looking at you in terms of your performance to make sure you can pay back a loan. So that perspective is a very narrow one in terms of understanding how you're doing business. And that's where, my, that's where my introduction to business began. And they're asking questions way beyond, are you just profitable? Because people think when they go to a bank, that's going to be the primary question. But as a financial analyst, I evaluated companies based on their operational ratios against published industry averages that many business people don't even know are out there using what's called a common size analysis. And that took me some time to understand as I first got into banking because I was comparing somebody that was $500,000 in sales with somebody that was $5 million in sales, and yet you can make them all make sense. And it's all done with using percentages as a measure of performance, which is why they call it common size. But we'll get into that a little bit further down the road. And that's where I began. I evaluated during that time business margins on products sold to see whether or not they were reasonable based against what the industry has. If you're getting 5% uh, cost of goods sold and your margin after that is 95%, is that what the industry is doing? What if you're getting a 50%? And we have to be able to evaluate that when we're in the bank to be able to look at whether you're going to be in business or not. So we played with those kinds of ratios. I had to calculate cash flow based on accounts receivable and accounts payable agings. And I would estimate a business's capital position to make sure they had enough cash, mostly because we didn't want you running out of money and not being able to pay back the loan. And worse yet, we didn't want you running out of money and not being able to pay payroll. Because one thing you learn as a banker is the day you can't make payroll as a small business is the day the keys become mine. And that's not necessarily fun in the state of Massachusetts to have to walk into a business and say, you didn't make payroll an hour ago, your business now belongs to me. And I've had to do that once or twice. And so banks try, we try very hard to be able to predict what's going to happen if that, is that coming so we can put things in place and make sure it doesn't. And so the other things we were doing is checking on how many months cash you really had to make sure you could weather economic conditions. And I started in banking in what they call dealer floor plan, all the cars that you see in a dealer's lot. And if a dealer ran out of money during the economic crisis of 79, when the world fell apart, you suddenly owned a whole lot of cars you didn't want to own. And banks didn't want to be there. So we began measuring cash and we measured unencumbered inventory. Those are things people don't think about. But if all of your industry, all of your inventory and supplies have an accounts payable against it, and it's time you're running out, you still owe the bills and you need more, and you don't have cash, you no longer have credit because you're not paying your bills, how does your business keep going? As bankers, we work very hard to make sure that didn't happen. So that was where I began learning about business and all the things that you didn't want to see happening. I learned that crisis in businesses come very, very silently. And without a solid footing, a business is delicate, even in the wake of a storm. Businesses 
can make it through some stuff, but if they're not ready, a good storm can topple the business if it's not well balanced. Banks only wanted the answers to make sure you could pay it back, but the questions that we had to ask in the bank were critically important and began telling me something about how businesses needed to plan. Right now, there are some businesses in Chicopee, and I don't know how many of you live in Chicopee right now. How many of you use the Willamancet Bridge that's getting ready to close? Now, I get lost going out of Springfield, so I'm not sure I know quite where the Willamancet Bridge is. <laughs> but I was listening on the news the other night to a businesswoman that, whose business is near the Willamancet Bridge, and she said, I simply don't know how my business can survive two and a half years with my main route of traffic gone away. Now, if she has not asked herself those questions that banks ask regularly to make sure they don't have to close the business down, starting to have to ask the question the day the crisis begins is a very difficult time to begin finding answers. You don't look for answers after the tornado's already blown down your house. And so that's a very important lesson to add that I learned very early at a bank. What do businesses need to know and when do they need to know it? My next position was as a commercial loan officer. And commercial loan officers are mostly salespeople, actually. They do very little real lending. They're usually selling trusts and other payroll and that kind of stuff. And I'm sorry, it didn't take either the bank or I long to figure out I am not a salesperson. I am a backroom girl and I like it back there. I like playing with numbers and figuring things out and putting the pieces together. So banking, commercial lending and I in terms of sales did not make it. But what I was able to do was to take that commercial lending ex the experience as a financial analyst and become a small business advisor as a commercial loan officer. And I worked with troubled businesses that were struggling to keep going. And I learned from the back door how businesses have to come back from being on the verge of going out, struggling back from inadequate cash, poor internal systems, and an undefined direction is an extremely onerous journey, even if you're well capitalized. Very few small businesses are capitalized to the point that that kind of a journey is survivable. If you haven't asked the questions in advance, and that's where you find yourself one day, finding the answer is extremely dicey because the crisis is not a very friendly place to be. I was able to save a lot of businesses during my years as a commercial small business workout specialist. I couldn't save them all. And the ones I couldn't save actually taught me more than the ones I could. I continued small business advising for years in the Mayor's Office in Economic Development in the 80s under Richie Neal when he was Mayor of Springfield with Jack Benoit. Those names may not be familiar to you, but Jack Benoit and Richie Neal were two of the biggest champions of small business that Springfield ever had. I wish they were still here. Life would be a lot easier for the small business community in this city. But they really believed that small businesses were the cog of the economic engine, and they worked hard to keep them going. And my job was to make sure small businesses understood enough about how to be a small business so that they could survive and be economically viable before they got into trouble. And that was a wonderful thing. So I learned business from another level, because now I wasn't trying to do away with a crisis. I was trying to avert one, and that gave me a whole other perspective. And when I went into higher education, I thought all of that was behind me. And as a compliance officer in the Office of Institutional Research, my biggest responsibility was planning an assessment to make sure that the college was on track to meet all the federal and state guidelines and to do everything that the accrediting agents and said it did. So even though it was in a not-for-profit educational setting, the issues and questions were the same. And all of the same stuff began to apply. And I began understanding from that that it's not the business you're in, it's the questions you ask. And so when I started business, I thought I had a real, I'm good, I understand business, I can do this. But being in business is not the same as understanding business. And it took me a long time to shake off that academic perspective of what makes sense, 
to the pain of, I may understand it up here, but what do I do with it down here? And all of the planning in the world didn't pick up the phone and start a pipeline. So no matter how expert at business systems I was, there was a bigger perspective to being in business than the questions that get classically asked at the bank. And that process opened up an understanding of planning assessment and small business that was a surprise for me. The outside piece of business, that sales piece that I bombed at at the bank, is still quite an uphill battle for me. I'd still rather be in the back room. But I've been able to develop a ladder with rungs comfortable enough for me to climb to begin to get into that marketing, sales, and networking. And maybe by the time I'm 100, I may, I may almost qualify as being somewhat good. But at least it's been able to get me started. And I did that ladder through the use of planning and assessment. It's not something that people normally think about. But planning and assessment will get you where you want to go. It's not the enemy of the small business. It's actually your friend. So through planning and assessment, I was able to demonstrify the concept of being in business to get something going. And that's what I want to share with you tonight. I love being able to help small businesses understand the stuff that's fun for me that may actually send you running from the room um, is actually really going to be something that I hope you will embrace as you understand it more comfortably. So tonight, the presentation is in fact growing your business from the inside out. Because no matter how big or small your business is, if your inside is not working, the inside of your business is not in order. Growth is the biggest enemy you're ever going to see. And everybody talks about grow your business, grow your business. But Peter Drucker talks about businesses that are right-sized. And a business is right-sized based on its market and who it's servicing, but also its internal capacity to be responsive. And business, small businesses don't usually take the time to understand what the internal capacity to be responsive is. And that's why so many businesses hit this point where they've been growing great guns, and all of a sudden, they're gone. They grew one step beyond their internal capacity to support that. And they didn't have the infrastructure to help them understand how to make that quantum leap. And so it becomes extremely incredible. So when the, pro when the program began, we listened to Val Nelson. And she told us about understanding our niche. And understanding our niche helps, helps us address the market issues that define our right size. But the, the critical thing is that if as a business owner, you are not managing your internal capacity to define your right size, you don't know what size you should be. So I've shared a little bit of my experience with you for, to explain why the presentation is about what it is. And the information I want to share with you tonight is going to be correct for you if you're one of these five businesses. If you know that your business is not running as well as it could because you spend most of your time putting out fires and addressing problems rather than making the improvements you'd like to make, this is for you. If you feel as if you don't have a good understanding of why you keep getting the business results you're getting no matter how hard you work and you'd like to gain a new understanding to be able to plot your next step, this is for you. If you are spending more and more of your time working in your business and getting less and less of what you want and are not getting to where you want to be, this is for you. Or if your business is growing successfully and you want to stay the course, this is for you or if you're ready to move your business to the next level, this information is for you. So if you're in the right place, if you're a business owner and you're looking for new answers to make your business responsive to where you want to take it. So what can you expect if you put these, what we talk about tonight into practice? By doing this work, you will empower, you will be empowered to take charge of your business in new and exciting ways and management, manage it with decisive, timely, effective decisions. More importantly, you will be able to quickly recognize when your business is off course, when you're stuck, or when you're going in the wrong direction, so you can make the course corrections that you need to get on the path you want to be on. And as a result, if you're a sole proprietor, you will have a clear vision 
of where you're going and be armed with the tools and information you need to get, get your hard work working the way you need it to accomplish. If you have employees, you'll create an environment of shared vision and purpose so they collectively, they will support business growth by choosing the most productive behaviors to help move your business forward. So what are we going to actually talk about tonight? We're going to talk about how to turn your business plan into a working GPS that lets you know when you are on or off course. We're going to talk about how to implement a system that lets you capture the timely information that you need about how your progress is going so you can make changes in meaningful ways. And we're going to talk about how to interpret and use that information to inform your business and to begin moving it in the right direction. And before you leave this evening, I'll share information about tools and training that will help you move to the next level so you can quickly turn on the GPS machine for your own business. Tonight I'm going to introduce the steps for growing your business from the inside out. First, we don't think about taking care of our business. That's kind of something we do business, we grow business, we don't take care of business, we work but we take care of ourselves. And in order for us to perform optimally, we have to take care of ourselves. But what if we thought about our businesses in the same way? So what do we normally do when we think about running a business? We start with a plan, even if it's just a two-line plan, we start with something that says this is what we want to do. Then we go, say, ready, set, fire! And we put the plan into action. Then we wonder at the end of the year why you're not where you want to be. Okay, the next year, you're going to commit to work harder and try new things and increase your marketing and get to where you're going to. Then at the end of the year, you wonder why you're not where you want to be. If any of that sounds familiar, is the third time really going to be a charm or do we need to change how we do business? But before we go into that, I want to talk about the business plan because People talk about business plan as if it's a generic term, and it's not. You have a business plan that you take to get funding from the bank. That's one kind of plan. It may or may not ever help you in your business. So what does a business plan need to look like in your business to help you with your business? First, it's going to have your marketing plan. Everything that Becky talked about before is something you have to strategize and plan out. That's your marketing plan. That marketing plan is not going to be as detailed, as specific for a bank, because they just want to know what your market is. But you need to know what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. That's the first piece of your business plan. You've got to make some critical decisions about which of Becky's 60 things are you going to use. How are you going to make them work, and how do they relate to what you're doing and what your market is. Second, you need an operational plan. <coughs> Last week, Suzanne talked about home-based home owned, home owned, business, businesses remembering when to close the door from the office and go, go be part of a family. Well, that's part of your operational plan. Those commitments that you make are all part of your <coughs> operational plan. You have to actually think that through and know what you're going to do. And the third is the financial plan so that you know what your resources are. And the resources may not just be money. They may not be dollars and cents. You need to understand your business in ways that you can be able to figure out what resources do I need. Those resources may be a customer list. They may be contacts in, in the government so that you know how to go forward and begin to do the kind of strategy you need. They may be associates or allies. They may not all be monetary, but they're all resources that you need to manage because they're going to dictate what you need to do. And by the way, that dreaded budget is part of your financial plan. You have to do that. Now these pieces sound like they're all separate, but they're not. They're interconnected. And if you create and manage a budget, the evidence how connected they are is right in front of you. You know you can't possibly know how much money you've got if you don't know how many customers you're going to service and how much income those are going to bring. And you know that if you don't know how many hours you're going to run your shop, how many customers you're going to be able to serve. 
And once you know those, you can figure out how much money you need to make that happen and build a budget. So they're all very, very interconnected. And the weaker one of them is, because you don't have the time to think about them, you put your business at great risk. Not having it may not be fatal until the storm hits. But when the storm hits, you have to find answers fast. And you have to make adjustments faster. And if you haven't challenged yourself to answer these questions, you're not going to have answers. And the storm can overtake you. The other thing about a business plan is it has to be a living document. You got to look at it. You can't just write it and sit it on a shelf and walk away. It has to be informed by what's happening in your business today, what happened yesterday, and tomorrow. You got to look at it again because something might have changed. You may need to go in a different direction, so you can't just put it on a shelf. By the way, you'll notice there has been something missing from everything I've talked about so far. The two words that small businesses always talk about are sales and profitability. But I haven't mentioned sales and profitability. Because sales are a byproduct of effective marketing. If you don't have effective marketing, you don't have sales. So you have a marketing plan. And from your marketing plan, you derive what your sales are going to be. And profitability is a byproduct of a well-managed business, well-managed resources and effective financial planning. If you haven't done that, and you don't have profitability, they don't come, they come because you've done something else. So you reflect those in the business plan. So the biggest question is, small planning, small, is planning correct for small businesses? And since I'm biased, I'm going to give you the sources that I have looked at. I wrote an article called Planning in Small Business, which I will be very glad to share with you, and I'll tell you how you can get that at the end. But I'm going to use the SBA and SCORE, the two biggest champions of small business. SCORE recommends that a small business owner should set aside at least two hours every week for thinking and planning. And according to SCORE, this allows them to run their businesses and not the other way around. Unfortunately, according to the SBA, the planning and controlling functions of management often receive less attention from small business owners or managers than they should. Writing your business plan is not an academic exercise. It's the living document that makes your business work. So what is the secret for turning your plans into reality and creating that GPS that will move your business forward? It begins with how you treat your business, not how you think about your business. Writing the plan is how you think about it, but it's only the beginning. All the other stuff that comes after the plan is how you think about your business. So we're going to do a little bit of visual imagery when we think about taking care of ourselves. And hopefully I don't drop anything on the floor. And I just, just want you to just kind of look at the pictures and think about what they make you think about. Just kind of. You might start with an idea that you need a little TLC today. What am I going to do to get some TLC? So you reach out and you take the next step and you find a way to get a little bit of help to take care of yourself today because it's not something we can do all by ourselves. So once we've gotten that, we take the next major step. And we go to that moment where we just tell the world to leave us alone for a little while. It's time for me to regroup. And after you regroup, you're ready. Maybe not to jump back into the water altogether, but you're ready to at least be out there. Then you're ready to share it with somebody. So you're kind of just building toward taking care of you for just a little while. What if we took care of our businesses as well as we took care of ourselves? How would our businesses operate? So now we're going to talk about the process that takes care of our business. It's three simple words. 
that everybody hates to hear. Plan, you do, and you check. That's the simplest concept and the hardest to do. You plan, you do, you check. Writing the plan, we just talked about. The do, that's something we just automatically kind of jump up and do. But the check, Last week, we talked about task management. And everybody talked about how they loved to check stuff off their list, because it meant they didn't have to think about it anymore. But the check-in planning doesn't work that way. Check doesn't mean you're finished. And that's the one we need to talk about. The check is incredibly important. The check is that step of the planning process that is the key to making your plan work for you, and it drives your business. The check is the GPS of your plan. We all love seasoned food. I haven't eaten salt since my husband was diagnosed with high blood pressure. So I've learned to eat very bland food. But an unseasoned business doesn't taste very good. So we need the check to put the salt in our businesses. So we're going to start with an example. We're going to do a little bit of work. But first, we want to make sure we're talking about the benefits of planning. So now we know, plan, do, check. We need to do that. A well-managed business is efficient, effective, directed, on purpose, intentional, sustainable, and profitable. That's what a plan gives you. The plan is the tool that empowers you to take care of your business. When you take care of your business, you know what makes your business tick, how it should be performing, and when it's not performing as expected. You know how to deploy your resources for the results you want. You know what needs to be fixed, what needs to be championed, or what needs to be better supported. And you have a clear direction to find and know where you are getting off course in time to make the mid-course corrections that you need. When you take care of your business, your employees have a shared understanding of where you are going and how they fit and what actions will positively affect the success of your business. And when you take time to pay attention to the details of your business, you directly influence the results that you get. But the devils are in the details. So what does taking care of your business really mean? We looked at plan, do, check, and now we're going to start doing a little bit of planning. We're going to take some time and really look at what the process is. I think that planning is something that we do comfortably when we say, I'm going to introduce this new product line next year. Next, That's a plan. We go, we get the products, we get them on the shelves, we've done it. That's the do. We do that very well. But since the real work begins after that vertical question, do we ask ourselves enough of the right questions so that we do those steps effectively. Tonight we're going to learn how to do just that. But we're going to build on some of the work we've already done. So going back to Val's lesson on building a new niche, we're going to build a new niche for our make-believe business. Now, the thing about plans is the most important question is the check. But the check doesn't come at the end, even though it says plan, do, check. The check begins when you write the plan, because you have to include goals. And Suzanne talked about goals a lot last week. But those goals she talked about had a lot to do with your own personal goals. Well, your business has goals, too. 
and you have to define what you hope to accomplish. So we're going to seed our plan by writing some goals. And we only want a couple. So if you were to decide to change your niche, what kind of goals would you expect? What do you want that to accomplish? Why would you change your niche? What would you hope to get out of changing your niche? Is there another reason we would change our niche? What other goal might we have? Higher response for our marketing. Janine? Okay, so we have three pretty solid goals. Those are good. We're going to tell you a story about athletes. Athletes improve by monitoring their own performance and competing against their past results. I've heard athletes say that the most important goal is to be better today than they were yesterday. This perspective is as applicable to business as it is to athletes. So now I have a question for you. We have three very good, solid, important goals. Are these going to tell us anything about how to direct our business? We need to be able to measure them. Okay. You're jumping the gun. You're doing good work. <laughs> Well-constructed goals in your business plan is what turns your plan into working G a GPS that tells you whether you're on course or not on course. So that said, my question is, what is the most critical characteristics that goals must have? We just heard one, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment. And she's absolutely right. Goals have to be measurable. The check continues through implementation. It continues through the do. By effectively monitoring your progress step by step, using a system that lets you capture your results in meaningful ways. If the athlete didn't capture his performance, he would be getting nowhere. In order, to in order to monitor progress, you need to know what you should be monitoring. In your plan, you set up goals that, it, that you want to achieve, but you did not include, but did you include, oh, that's okay, the how will I know I got there question. And it's the how I know I got there question that becomes so important. Therefore, one of the most critical characteristics that goals must have is that goals must first be observable and measurable. However, goals must also be actionable. They must tell us what steps we need to take to achieve them. So we have these goals. The question is, are they observable? Are they measurable? Or are they actionable? Are these goals going to give us a GPS to tell us what we want to know? The answer to the how, how will I question also tells you when to monitor your progress. Because if you only monitor the final outcome, how will you know if and when you're off course? How will you know when you need a course correction to keep you on track so you don't go too far afield. It's because you begin to monitor from the beginning. Therefore, goals have one other critical characteristics they have to have. They have to be observable. They have to be measurable. They have to be actionable. They have to be time-bound. You have to know by when. And if you're a sole proprietor, you don't have to worry about by whom. 
If you have employees, the by whom comes in. But you always have to know by when. So we have these goals, but how are we going to change them to be observable, measurable, actionable, and time bound? So what do we need to do to these goals? Let's look back. How much new business? How much new business? So how much new business would make sense? Get, exactly, get 10 new customers. <coughs> when do you want to get them by? Next week. <laughs> there is one other thing that goals need to be. Really? That's the one. <laughs> See, I did. <laughs> yeah, so you want them by when? Next month. <laughs> Next month. Okay, so one of our other goals was better response to our marketing. So what does a better response to our marketing look like? What would you do with that? How many people responded to whatever thing that I just did that was, that was my marketing? Exactly. So one way you, you might say that is increase my yield response. or my response rate. To my marketing by 5%, 10%? Does that make it measurable? By when? <laughs> and we had one last goal that had to do with taking advantage of new trends and technology. So how would you make that? Just like all the social networking. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of you can take your try of blasting stuff here and there, but use your analytics, mm -hmm. like Google or anything, to see whether it all adds up. Okay. So you're going to take advantage of technology by getting what kind of a response rate on Google in your analytics. Right. And we won't. Well, some people do it as, you know, you know, every day, or it could be, you know, every week, depending on what you're doing online. So how many new visitors do you want? 500 a week? Maybe a million. <laughs> oh, well, you can do that. You can do that. <laughs> so we'll stick with by next month. So now we started with some very important goals. But now we know what those goals need to look like. We've got a very clear direction. What's so important about that is not only do you now have a very clear direction about those goals, you now have something you can do with those goals. And what you can do with those goals is the next step. And that's where the check begins. You need a systemic method of collecting information on your performance on each of the facets of your business that you decide to monitor. Examples of the kinds of things you might include, and we've gotten those, number of new customers are here, um, response rate, custo you know, call yields, number of client complaints, all of those kinds of things. Sears uh, cracked me up when I went to go pick up something the other, uh, the other day at Sears. They have a timer that ticks off. You are customer number. You will be served in. All customers will be served within for them, it's like under five minutes. And they actually have a timer that ticks whether or not they make the five minutes. Their reason is not to get you out of the store in five minutes, but their premise is, 
Customer loyalty comes from satisfaction. Satisfaction comes from rapid service and attention to the customer's needs. If we can serve you quickly, then you're going to feel like we care about you and you're going to come back. Well, that started in fast food. Who was it, McDonald or Burger King that said you'd have your food hot in a minute? Mm, I don't know the last time you waited burger death, but ah, the timer broke a long time ago there. And they're, you know, they're, they've been struggling to introduce new foods and things to get people in. Why? Because one of their most critical metrics at the beginning is no longer a metric they either value or use. But that's there. So the data collection mechanism that you use is going to capture the information that you need to tailor, that needs to be tailored to what's appropriate and meaningful to you. So if you have, your, in, your interest is in response rate, it doesn't help to have something that captures how many pieces you sent out. If you're saying, okay, I sent out a thousand pieces last week, why aren't I getting more business? Um, your metric is now wrong because you want to know that your marketing mattered because out of that thousand pieces, how many people did you get an answer from? Your system needs to begin to capture that. The most effective, oh, did you have a question? The most effective system is one that's embedded in what you do the way you do it. If you have to create a system that's contrived on top of your workflow, you're never going to do it because it's extra. And we, none of us want to play extra work. So it's an embedded process. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? I have six sigma experience. Okay. Some experience. I'm talking about unit cost and mm -hmm. response rate and yield rate, things like that. What's really important from an outcome perspective is to think about not what you want for an outcome, but the outcome the customer is expecting. Mm -hmm. So if you think your response rate should be within right. two days, what is your customer expecting? Because right. that's the metric you should be driving towards. So exactly. And some of, the, some of the metrics that you create are going to have a customer focus because you've got to meet the customer's expectation. Some of the metrics that you set up have to do with how efficiently you internally handle something. So if you get a response from a customer, do you have an internal mechanism to make sure that, am I shipping fast enough? If my, if, if my time from the time I get the order till the time I can ship it is four days, then is your internal system helping your business or hurting your business if your customers are expecting it within 24 hours? So you've got to evaluate your internal systems. When I was at, I was at Stick. For 22 years, one of the things that I had, now I was a customer service office, and 99% of the work I did was internal. And the efficiency of my office mattered because one of the things I did was federal reporting compliance. And if I blew that, it was a $25,000 fine for every day I was late, plus I could go to jail. So <laughs> it was a bad thing, I could go to jail. And so, I did an evaluation of my office regularly, and I captured on a regular basis my efficiency in turning work over and getting things done. So how quickly did the client need it? By all means. How quickly did the pieces I have to do in-house to make sure the client got it became extremely critical metrics. So that, that became a very important measure, the two sides of the coin. What happens outside, what happens inside. Thank you for that observation. So things need to be measurable. But you need to have some way of reporting them out. You go to a game, you watch an athlete. They set goals all the time. They want to know where they're going. They want to kick 60 yards field goals. They want to run a six minute mile. Or they want to win Remington. So, your athlete goes out every day 
and tracks the yard she keeps and has all the internal systems and they create diaries and diaries and diaries of their own performance. At the end of a month, they have 30 days worth of performance. But if they left it there and did nothing with it, did tracking it do any good? I don't think so. So the check concludes with the interpretation and use of the data. You have to use it to improve and inform your business in order to move it forward. Interpreting your, require, your business requires that you have something to check that performance against. Because if the, he wa uh, the athlete wants to know he wants to kick 60, year, 60 yards, he's got yards on a field goal, on the, on the field to measure. The athlete that wants to do a six minute mile has a timer that says, okay, you want to do six minutes? You're still at 12. Uh, you got a long way to go. If you don't have something in your business that tells you what you want to get to, then you don't have a standard to compare where you are. So the tools that you're going to use to do that are the internal metrics, which we at, the, we at, at Stick used to call benchmarks, which is what you want to get to. Your customers want service within 24 hours. That's a very clear metric. We're getting service to our customers in 36. You know how far you're off because you've got a standard of which to go to. And then you've got the external metrics that include best practice outcomes for your industry, industry norms, and the performance of inspiration, aspirational peers. But those are probably jargon that come from an old day that don't mean anything. So I'm going to explain them for a minute. Best practice includes whatever documented behavior consistently gets the intended results. I go to Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers require you keep a food diary. That's a best practice for dieting. And more and more you're hearing of diet saying if you want to lose weight, if you're going to keep a food diary because that's going to let you know what you've done, where you're going and how close you are to what you got. That's best practice. I don't do it, but that's best practice. The X is industry norms. An industry norm is the average performance of an industry. And there's a couple of places to get them. The Office of the Census of the United States has a, an economic census that monitors all kinds of information that you can use to find out what other businesses in your industry are doing on certain kinds of metrics, at least the ones they collect in the census. Another are industry watchers, such as Dun & Bradstreet. You can go and you can find out the average payroll for a certain business is X percent, operational ratios, common size, X percent of total revenue. Cost of goods sold is X percent product loss, theft, whatever. They have standards that say, as a whole, this is what you can expect in the industry. And the last one is the aspirational peers. An aspirational peer is a business that you admire. That business is doing great guns, and I want to do. He's doubled in size. He started with one chain, and now he's got two. That's an aspirational peer. For me as a writer, when I started in this business, I began looking for what I could have as an aspirational peer. And I began finding the books published by writers that said, how to make six-figure salaries and stop getting a penny a word. That's a good thing. That's a good aspirational peer. And so those became my aspirational peers. What do they do to get to where they are? What can I learn from them? How can I use their guides of what they achieved as a guide for me to know and how long it might take me to get there? How long did it take them? Those are my aspirational peers. In, as you check your industry, your competition, and you know what they're doing, there may be somewhere out there that you admire that you can get information on as an aspirational peer. They may be publicly held, they may be privately held. You need a report card. A scoreboard during a game tells you who's winning. That's a report card. 
but you need a report card that works for you. One system that I like is very simple. Needs correction, acceptable, or exceeds expectation. But there are tons that you can, depending on which philosophy of, of uh, performance measurement you use, uh, there, are, there are several ways and report cards that you can set up for that. And you, uh, you need a systemic way of reporting those evaluation results. When you were in the world of corporate and you actually had a boss over you every year, you got an evaluation. Well, businesses need the same thing. You need to be reporting to yourself what your business is doing. Who needs to see that? What do they need to see? What do they need to know? That's something that you need to think about when you're going there. Then, after you've measured it, after you've captured it, after you've done all of that work, the next thing you need to do is understand what it means. If you had hoped that you were going to get 10 new customers and you only got five in a month, why did you only get five? You had your standard, you had your goal. What didn't happen that you didn't get your five customers? You look at your business practices, you look at your processes, and you don't have just one metric. You know what leads into that process. You know the steps you have to take to get to that process. Maybe some of those need to be measured more closely than just the number of customers that you added. Because maybe there's something in one of those that's not working quite the way you want it to that kept you from getting to those customers. And so the last part of that is once you've done all of that work, you have one final challenge. And that is you figured out what it is, you figured out what the answers is, what the problems are, where everything is. It really is plan, do, check, plan, do, check, plan, do, check. Everything you learned from the first check process that followed, you wrote the check issues into the plan. You monitored the check issues in your doing. You learned what they meant in your check. You use all that information to start the plan all over again. So in closing, we have reviewed the plan do check process. We've learned that the check is the essential part of the planning process. We've also learned that the check is not a single step, but it is the central step to the cycle. The check begins by embedding actionable, observable, measurable, time-bound goals into your plan to turn on your plan's GPS. The check continues through implementation by developing a systemic mechanism to capture, monitor, and report performance results in intervals that are appropriate to your business. One month may be right for one business. Six months may be more right for another. Ninety days may be more right for another. It may take another a couple of years to break into something. And so you have incremental. When I think of time bound, I think of gateways. And my mind automatically goes back to those in Central Park when they had those flags and they were like gateways that let you walk through. That to me is what the planning system is. They're gateways that let you know where you are and you can go through the maze as often as you want to. The check concludes with the two-part process of interpreting the performance data captured in your report card-like system based on either internal benchmarks or external benchmarks that provide the point of comparison between where you want to be and where you are, and then using that data to help improve your business, course correct, or move to the next level. And finally, we discussed the plan needs to be a living document that is part of a cyclical process where the information learned from the check translates into your new plan, which is how you are able to define the new steps you need to process. And at the beginning of the evening, I promised that I would let you know where to get more information. And hmm. Yes. One of the things that I have done is I know that I've given you a lot of information tonight. And so I have developed a handout for you that summarizes what we've talked about so that you have it. And on the back of that, it's a little booklet, four-page booklet. On the back of the booklet is a template so that you can look at the goals that you have for your business and ask yourself, are they observable? Are they measurable? Are they actionable? 
are they time bound? If they're not, how do I fix this? It's just a template that gets you thinking about the goals that you have in your business and how to emp empower yourself to make them more active so that they are a roadmap of where your business is going to go. I mentioned the article that I wrote on small business planning. If you will, um, there's a sign up sheet in the back that if you will put your email number on that, I will send you the link. I will send you a copy of that as well as a link to several of the other articles I wrote on performance management and planning. There's also numerous books. There are so many systems on management, planning, and, and assessment that they make me dizzy. But my favorite is the balanced scorecard, mostly because the balanced scorecard is easy, it's visual, it plays with little spreadsheets, and it doesn't take a lot of sophistication or training or certification to use the balanced scorecard. It takes your goals and you're deciding what your standard is. And then it's a column for red, a column for green, and a yellow, and a column for green. The red means it needs correction. The yellow means I can live with it. And the green means I did way better than I expected. And you put your results there, and you've got a visual record of how you did. And then you decide how you're going to go to the next step. That's my favorite. The SCORE and SBA websites have a ton of information. They have training modules and all kinds of things out there. And finally, I do work with small businesses to talk through some of these issues. And if you'd like to talk to me at any time, you're quite welcome to. I want to thank you for taking the time to play with me. And I wish you well in your businesses. Plan well and prosper.